um, good morning, everyone. I'm just aware that we are well behind time. I'm Monica McWilliams, um, and we have um, panel members which are listed on your sheet in your pack. Um, uh, we have Jeff Hamilton to my far left, and instead of Sandra Peake, who sends her apologies, um, because she is um, tied up in some very urgent business in WAVE this morning that has to be sorted out before the weekend. Um, and Alan McBride, who is well known to all of us, um, is also a colleague of Sandra's at WAVE and will be replacing Sandra on the panel. Um, and then we have um, a number of others here, Alex Bunting um, to my right. Um, and we have Stephen White, um, and we have Andrea, um, and you're all very welcome. So we have all our panel members in place. Um, we're going, time is short. Um, I'm going to ask each of the panel members to speak briefly um, and then throw it open. I'm aware that the workshops are supposed to start in about 25 minutes and you're meant to get a break before that and we've one two three four five panel members um, and if the panel members take up to five minutes we'll have no time for questions and no time for a break so we may have to push the workshops on a little um, and I'll take my cue from Luke um, and we'll go with an extra 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. So we'll, this will run then for to 12, 25 or 12.30 at the very latest. Um, who wants to go first? Shall we do the obvious and start with yourself, Jeff? Good morning, everybody. Um, for me, the work that I do uh, is really in Mid-Ulster, uh, where We've only really got a group started in the last six months. So we've got 400 people who would consider themselves to be victims and survivors who have joined that particular club, that particular group. Um, so we're very much in a case where everything's really new and a lot of people are coming forward who haven't, you know, uh, who haven't expressed or uh, haven't been able to find a group uh, in the Mid Ulster area. So, and I also work then doing some work with families who are engaged with HET, the coroner's court and so on and have been doing that for the last five or six years. I was also a member of the, of the Victims Forum. So a lot of times I'm coming from a more holistic perspective in the whole thing and it was very interesting to hear the judge saying that it had to be a victim centred approach to this, to this problem. Um, a lot of stuff, I come from an education background and also one of the first schools to do family support. Um, within school, looking at all the issues around children, why children don't achieve. Um, so when I when I look at that per perspective, you know, I I see a lot of people coming into me with maybe a specific issue. If I have to go and maybe talk about an ATT report, and once you visit those people in the house, then you start to see all sorts of other issues that are there. Once you get to know them and trust them, then you get to know that there are lots of other issues that are going on in that family, and and it's only after you develop that trust. That, that they will start to, to talk to you and start to explain the issues that they have. In my experience, a lot of times, if you don't understand the justice issues that, some, that many families have, if you don't have a really good understanding and empathise with those justice issues that those families are going through, and the day-to-day -day problems that, that justice issues do cause for those families, um, then you, you won't be accepted. And then all the other work that you need to do in relation to services and so on, really is wasted. So in my opinion, if we don't deal with the justice issues and the truth issues, you can spend all the money you like, but you're not going to make the impact and, and actually taking that person to a better place. So the key issue for me is you know, the sort of things that we can do in terms of reparation. If, if, when we talk about compensation or, or financial stuff, when we mentioned the financial lump sum of £12,000, it was an absolute non-starter for the people that I worked with. But on the other side of that, there has been some work done by the VSS that has shown that some sort of other creative way of looking at financial assistance, and I know that some of the guys and girls in the, in the forum have been looking at a pension. 
so that it's all about being creative and taking, taking the issues that victim survivors have as a whole, not just looking at some people and saying, you know, I feel really out of place here today because I come from a rural area in Cookstown. This is Belfast, and for me, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of difference between the issues that people have in Belfast as victim survivors compared to the issues they have in, in Cookstown. So, other forms of, of reparation that, that we have problems with um, is an all around, you know, being safe, being satisfied, being comfortable, being, being able to, to be able to come and take part in a group without fear of, of being threatened and all that goes along with that. As one of the lessons I found in Middleston is there are lots of families who still live in fear. And somebody might say to me, but sure, that, you know, the violence and all that is all, is all really dropped off. But the key point is, if somebody feels as if their life's at risk and they genuinely believe that, that's the key point, because that's what affects them in their life. So say, I could, I could, I could we could talk, I've only, only, only got five minutes, but one of the, one of the, the most you know, evident things that, that happens as well in terms of victim survivors is that for 40 years in terms of justice in particular, and in terms of services more recently, they tend, they tend to be taken to the top of the hill and then it all disappears on them. Or they tend to be promised something that they get some sort of hope and then it's dashed. So what we have to try and do is, if whatever we're going to do, we have to try and bring everybody on board, we're going to have to try and make it sustainable and we're going to have to stop you know, things that sort of happened this last while where it's taken us 40 years to get some money into Mid Ulster to do some good work and we're only going six months, and then we lose 4.4% of it. Now, the message that sort of thing sends out is absolutely horrendous. And I mean, and the final point I'll make, and what the judge said, I fully agree as well. And we're talking about torture. But a lot of stuff that we talk about, we assume that these things are all, you know, back before 1998. But you don't have to be too long living in Cookstown to know that we had a family who only recently had a, had a family member murdered. That happened. We've had bombs falling off cars. Those things are still happening. A lot of the families are still thinking the same way. So the, so the problem I have is that, that we have to try and in some way believe what these people are saying and honestly empathize with the problems they have. If you think of a lot of the families that I work with, they believed in the state and the state let them down. They also had a really, really horrendous murder in their family. And that's caused us problems. So who is that family really going to rely on? You might say Stormont. And we all know that the difficulties we've had there in relation to victim survivors. So I think sometimes we need to change maybe the glasses we're looking with and see the people in a different way. Thank you very much for listening to me this morning. Thank you, Alex. Okay. Well, can I first of all say that uh, I really wish that Sandra was here this morning um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one being that I am really fed up talking about this stuff, if I'm being honest with you, because I've been talking about it for the last 15 or 20 years, and whilst there's been some changes made, and I absolutely respect that, and some of those things have been good, um, but we're pretty much where we were uh, in relation to truth, justice, reparations, and all of that. There's been three major consultations that have happened in that time. I'm very proud to be associated with Healing Through Remembrance, which I think have done the bulk of the work to date. Uh, and again, who's listening? With Eames Bradley, which I think came up with, with very plausible way forward, again, gathering dust on a government shelf somewhere, and of course, of late, uh, we had uh, Haas O'Sullivan. And to be honest with you, if we were to go on talking about these issues for another 15 or 20 years, and no matter who was involved in the discussions and the debates, what they would come up with wouldn't be remarkably different from what is presently on the table. So for me, I think the time for talking is over, and I think it's now time to start talking about how to seriously implement some of the proposals that are already on the table. Of course, the big question is, um, are our politicians up for the job? I set myself uh, two major tasks in life after uh, my wife was killed in uh, 1993, and we got into uh, peace negotiations, and we had the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. And those two things for me were 
to come up with some sort of a sophisticated way of dealing with our past and to produce a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. And I have to say to you, on both counts, um, it has been a remarkable failure. And it has failed, in my view, uh, for the same reason, the lack of political will to actually agree uh, these processes. You know, our process, the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process is actually plotted around the world as being a remarkable success story. And there's no doubt there's parts of that which are true. Northern Ireland society, I think, has been transformed. Um, but I don't think it's a success story that we pretend it is. And sometimes uh, I wonder if we should be taken up under the Trade Descriptions Act <laughs> in terms of uh, how we're, we're selling it around the world. Because when it comes to the big issues, the big contentious issues, we have still uh, failed uh, to reach um, an agreement which leads us to the kind of shared society that I and so many more like me voted for back in 1998. If I could just finish uh, in my contribution, and I wanted to say a lot more this morning, but I know time is tight, and I thought what I would do was just to try and make it really personal in terms of what has actually helped me uh, in my life to be from where I was when my wife was murdered to where I am today. And there are three things which I can really uh, point out, and all of them have to do with reparations. First of all, compensation. I was quite fortunate when Sharon died that she happened to be working. And because she was working, I was able to get a wee bit of compensation. It wasn't a lot. Uh, it certainly didn't compensate for the loss of life. But it did mean that I was able to uh, leave work, uh, to find a new career, um, to eventually leave house, to move into a new area, and to really to get my life back on track again. And that money, for me, whilst you know, it wasn't everything. It certainly helped. Second, education. Uh, through the Northern Ireland Memorial Fund, I was able to secure a grant to be able to go uh, to university. Uh, I left school at 16 with no qualifications whatsoever and uh, spent my life as a butcher for many, many years up until Sharon died. And through the Northern Ireland Memorial Fund, I was able to secure some money uh, to go to university. And uh, I, I went, got a first class honours degree in community youth work and uh, also then completed my masters um, at the Irish School of Acumenics um, after that. Again, with the help uh, provided to me by the Northern Ireland Memorial Fund, which in a, a sense for me was a type of reparations program. And then the third thing, and probably for me the most profound uh, thing that happened to me in terms of my own particular journey, was when I was in Edinburgh uh, with a couple uh, of other people from Northern Ireland uh, at a symposium on psychiatry. They were wanting to look at whether post-traumatic stress disorder had come to Northern Ireland. And I happened to go out one night with two former prisoners, uh, a loyalist and a Republican. And we were just having a drink in Edinburgh, and I was telling my story, they were telling theirs. And at the end of it, uh, the Republican touched me on the hand, and he says, you know, Alan, what happened that day in the Shankill Road back in 93 was wrong, and I, as an Irish Republican, am sorry. And for me, uh, in that moment in time, because he acknowledged what had happened to me was wrong, I was able to listen to his story for the first time and to understand uh, the types of experiences that he went through that made him the kind of person uh, that he became. Now, of course, when we talk about apology, there are good apologies and there are botched apologies. I had a botched apology years ago uh, from Jerry Adams, and for those of you that will know my story, you will know that I used to take placards and stand outside Sinn Féin offices, and I used to hound Jerry Adams around um, New York, Washington, and Boston, and London. Uh, and I was doing all of that campaigning work because Jerry Adams, for me, was the man that carried the coffin uh, of the, the, the person that murdered my wife. And after all of that, and writing letters to him and all sorts of stuff, um, he actually said to me, you know, Alan, we in Sinn Féin understand your hurt and your pain, but you have to understand that there's nobody working harder for reconciliation than Sinn Féin. And that came to me about two weeks after the IRA murdered um, a guy in Lurgan by the name of Fred Anthony. He just happened to be a cleaner in an RUC station, and they put a bomb under his car, and it killed him, uh, and it seriously wounded his little daughter, Emma, um, who I'll actually see in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we still keep in touch. And that, when that letter came from Jerry Adams, uh, I was looking down at the photograph of that little girl with the tubes all coming through her from her face. And I had to say to myself, how in the name of God could you be working for peace and reconciliation when you know, you're carrying out these kind of atrocities, not against members of the security forces, but just against a man who happened to be a cleaner in an RUC station? I have to say to her that I've met Jerry Adams several times since, and those conversations have been much more pleasant. And I have had an apology from Jerry Adams, one which actually meant so much more to me. And I do see uh, within the Republican movement that he is someone that has tried to move his people away from violence, and I, I, I give respect to that. But nonetheless, uh, that very, you know, sort of primitive uh, apology to me 
uh, was something in those days which actually set me back a little bit. Just to absolutely wrap up, and I see you kicking me under the table here, Monica. Um, can I say that, you know, when I'm having conversations about this and we're talking about things like reparation and dealing with the past, people quite often say, but you know, Alan, this is really the wrong time to be asking about this stuff. The country is practically heading towards bankruptcy in terms of uh, austerity measures and failure to, you know, to secure welfare reform. And I'm sure you've heard of that debate on the, on the radio. It's been on at night for, for weeks and, and, and for months. I was in uh, Colombia. I was very interested in what the judge had to say um, about Colombia. I was there over the summer. Which I'm not claiming at all to be an expert uh, in the Colombian peace process. Um, I was talking to a number of people, and they were telling me uh, that there was something like six or 6.1 million victims identified in Colombia, and there is a reparations program in place. Not perfect, absolutely not perfect. Not ticking all the boxes for all of the people, but Colombia is a nation which is a developing nation. You know, it is not in that sort of first world of nations. And if they can do something in Colombia for 6.1 million victims. The UK being one of the richest nations in the world for a population in Northern Ireland of 1.7 million people, I think for me, it's about prioritization. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alan. And over to you, Andrea. Um, first of all, thank you very much to Luke and to everyone who's organized this conference. I think it's so important that we have um, these issues framed in human rights and in the rights of victims. And it's very rarely we get the opportunity to do it in this format. Um, I have something for 10 minutes worked out here, so please excuse me if I sound nervous and I, and I don't cover it, because I know I won't do justice to these issues um, to the extent that you'd like to. But in the context of um, a rights-based framework and in the context of us going into workshops to discuss it, I really want to raise two issues, um, both around the area of discrimination. The first area of discrimination against the rights of victims who've been most harmed during our conflict, I want to raise is that of civilians. While we have certainly kicked the issue of dealing with the past down the road from the peace agreement, and while that was for very understandable reasons, that didn't mean that reparations weren't included in some of the transformative projects that were undertaken as part of the Good Friday Agreement. We had part of the good, a very, very small section of the Good Friday Agreement talking about um, sympathy for victims and about the need to ensure that there are community responses and support services for victims of the conflict. That's in there. But of course, the big parts were about the transformation of um, the, the larger institutions, and in particular, criminal justice and policing, in order to, for us to move forward in a peaceful society, in a transformed society. Part of that involved confidence building measures. And there were payments that were made under the patent severance scheme, on, um, new uh, restitution scheme set up for people who served within those agencies in order to provide recognition for service that was done there. But that was done in the context of not saying why that transformation was needed. No one said why we needed to transform from the RUC to the PSNI, but we did it. And we spent half a billion pounds doing it. We did it with new schemes put in place, and we did it with severance packages. And that was fine. That was absolutely fine. But in the meantime, civilian population, the overwhelming majority of those hurt and harmed by our conflict were left behind with very menial processes with the Memorial Fund and now the Victims and Survivors Service. And that's something we need to think about very seriously, that there is a disparity. And that undermines the confidence of the new institutions. And that, so one thing links into the other. And that's important because victims and survivors say it. They may not say it very loudly. They may, say, they may stand back a little bit because they want to make sure that the peace is encouraged and they are the ones with the biggest vested interest in ensuring that we never go back to the dark days. But they feel it and they say it all the time. And it's difficult to say it and it's contentious and it certainly creates controversy. So when we go into workshops, I'd like people to be honest about that disparity that's out there. It's not good enough that people who did not make choices during our conflict are left in a situation where they are going to schemes that are completely inappropriate and where they feel like they're beggars. It's not good enough. The second area of discrimination I want to raise is that against women. When we have processes of truth and justice that are not seen as rights, when we have 
when we have processes which don't identify gender harms. Women experienced our conflict differently. They experienced the harms that were created in a different way, but we have never applied a gender lens to that. We know because the organisations we belong to, Widows Against Violence Empowered, Relatives for Justice, they're founded by groups of women who came together and who knew what they needed. They needed group support, they needed processes that involved peer support with their families within their communities. And they, they grew and that was acknowledged with no small due to the person sitting beside me in the Good Friday Agreement. That was acknowledged, but now we have services that are individualised. There's a whole process to make sure that we have individual victims who get therapy, who get that kind of support, while groups together and processes are undermined, and that undermines women. The Victims and Survivors Service is, is doing work where they laud the fact that there are more men who are coming forward for support, and that's a very good thing. But women are absenting themselves from assessment and absenting themselves from being involved in those processes. We see it in our group and other groups do as well, but we don't apply a gender lens. We don't ensure that women's participation and empowerment and involvement in the, all that we are doing is at the centre of things. So, I'm sorry, my nerves are away. <laughs> so, if we are discussing these issues in workshops, in the big house talks, if, if we are going to discuss truth, justice and reparations, because people don't separate those needs out. They don't have, this part of my life is for truth, this part for justice, this part for reparation. It's all in together in getting up in the morning, getting your kids out the door and trying to get your shopping done while you're listening to what's happened and dealing with the past. If we are going to do that, we need to ensure that the vast majority of victims and survivors of our conflict are included in those processes on an equal basis. So they have a vested interest in it and we need to ensure that women have equal participation and equal voice. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Andrea, and I apologise that you, every speaker on the panel undoubtedly feels under pressure because of the time constraints, so thank you to our speakers so far for maintaining that. Um, Alex. Okay. I'm a very shy and <laughs> person, so bear with me. And thank you, Luke, for inviting me here today to speak. Uh, I'm just an ordinary working class man, nobody special, just caught up in this. I was blown up with an under booby trap car bomb underneath my car in 1991. I lost my left leg, my other leg was badly injured, and um, I suffered from severe uh, shrapnel damage and things like that. I lost my spleen, stuff like that. But anyway, it has been a hard struggle for the likes of me to, from the day I was blown up until today, and I mean, coming through the likes of uh, the medical end of it, it, it took 12, 12, 12 months for that, and about a period of five years after that to, to try to come to terms that I no longer was the man that I was the day I walked out the door to go to my work. You know, and, and it's very hard, and to relate back to, to what Andrea was saying about women, I mean, without my wife and my children, but especially my wife, I don't think I'd have been here today to be honest with you, and, you know, I have to, pray, I couldn't praise her enough because, I mean, without her, I don't think, definitely, I would have been here. But to move on from that, now you know who I am the, the, and why I'm here. I, I'm here because I'm on the Victims of Irish Forum. I have been from the reception uh, this last five years and, and one thing or another. But my main uh, focus today when you're talking about reparations is, I joined a group uh, in the Wave Trauma Centre, it's a Wave Injuries group, which is about 25 people who have been severely injured through the conflict, troubles, whatever you like to call it. And um, we sit down after Eames Bradley and look through Eames Bradley and seeing there was very little in it for the severely injured people and all of that. So we decided that what we would do is we would highlight this and we took to the streets with, uh, around all the towns, all the cities and what have you, and, and looked at a petition. We got 10,000 signatures, which we then took to uh, Stormout. We lobbied all politicians. 
we done research. We got money from the, the uh, Victims Commission to do research into just uh, severely injured people. So we done that with uh, the help of Marie Breen Smith out of uh, Surrey University. And every time we were going back to, to politicians and people in power, they were saying, ask us questions to find this out, find that out, and find the other thing out. And I mean, I, I found that really, really disgusting because I mean, they're the people who should be finding these things out, not us. But there again, we went, we done it, we got it all sorted out. We then went and met, lobbied all politicians, all political groups, all heads of parties, and everybody has said it's a good idea for a, a pension for severely injured people. And when I say severely injured people, I mean people who are sitting paralyzed today, people who has no limbs, people who has blind, people who have brain injuries, who's never ever going to change, it's never going to happen, somebody's legs is not going to go back, you know, people's not going to get up out of a wheelchair and walk again. This is what we're talking about. And I know it's, it's, it's sometimes people say, ah, oh, but what about me? Unfortunately, I have a faith for any victim, but one thing I will say is, you know, this, we were only given this to look at severely injured people, and that's what we have done. But we went and we met with the Deputy First Minister who en engaged with us and had told uh, the Commission at that stage to do further work on the work that we had already done. So that has now taken place. We got all sorts of experts in, we got lawyers in, we got you know people to price it in, the way to set it up. It has now been sent to the OFMDFM and it's sitting on their desk from the commissioner left in July, June, July. And we don't know where any response, nobody's got back to us, telling us anything about it. You know, and, and you know, at the present time, we don't know where we are because, I mean, if you look at the way victims have been treated within the sector this last way back, when you, you, you look at the likes of uh, the way the VSS has turned out, you know, and I, I was one of the people who sat on a, a, a pilot form to, to sort of talk about what way services would be put forward for the needs of victims. And let me tell you, it has not turned out the way we were talking about all them years ago because it is an absolute disaster. You know, and it is not rolling out at all for the needs of victims, at all. You know, but there again it's another story. And we roll on and roll on, but this thing keeps rolling on and nobody gives us any answers. Now, the crux of the matter is there's 357 severely injured people in Northern Ireland. You know, you, you would think of a bit more, but there isn't. That's what is the, there's 357, right? And our main problem is, and I, I have to say this, there's a small amount of people, which is, I think, 10 of Protestants and Catholics who were paramilitaries who were injured at their own hands, out planting bombs, shooting, whatever that happens. And the Deputy First Minister and the First Minister have two completely different uh, outlooks on it. And under the 2006 order of the Good when it, it was signed up to in Northern Ireland, uh, they all agreed. Now, on the VSS for needs of victims, these 10 people who, if you want to call them people, certain people call them perpetrators, other people call them different things, but they are paid. They receive what everybody else receives, right? But if you go to Peter Robson, Peter Robson says, uh, we will not pay anybody that committed anything. So. 357 people is held to ransom because of them 10 people. We go to Martin McGuinness, Martin McGuinness turns around and says to us, well, unless you're paying everybody and, and that there, and them 10 people as well, we can't buy into it. So we're caught in a dilemma in the middle of all of this. And let's remember that these people did say enough to this. You know, and, and it, 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 it's very hurtful, especially when you take into consideration the 357 people which I speak about is very uh, elderly, becoming old and all that there, and we're all in our later ages, and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, people, you know, will not probably see it, because we were told the other day it could take 10 or three to five years, you know, so all of that. I've been told to shut up, so I have to move on, okay, sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done,
Have a couple of slides over here. All right, go ahead, go ahead.